Welcome in to another excursion around amateur radio and the wider world of communications. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1231 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Amateurs take to the airwaves on the Hurricane WatchNet and a lot more to provide emergency communications during Hurricane Ian. We will have team coverage. The FCC grants an ARRL request for amateurs to use higher baud or symbol rates on the low bands for emergency communications efficiency during the hurricane. The Radio Amateurs of Canada reorganize existing call areas and create a new call area. We will have all the details. Doreen Bogdan Martin, KD2JTX, is elected as the next Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union. The ARRL opens up a new application period for the club grant program. We will tell you what you need to know. There are new beacons on the air on CW and FT8. We will tell you where they are coming from and where to listen for them. An engineering firm in New York publishes a paper on what caused the collapse of the Arecibo Observatory. The ACMA in Australia is looking for input on proposed changes to amateur regulations. And we will have the latest on upcoming contests, conventions, and a peek at solar propagation conditions all coming up in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the newly implemented Snoopers Act, better known as the Investigatory Powers Act in the UK. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will talk about what he calls the Patriot and Amateur Radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns to begin his series, The Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the very beginnings of amateur radio. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the various methods of sealing coax connections on your tower and general antenna mounting. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Sitting in for Will Rogers, K5WLR this week, and reporting from our headquarters studio just outside Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our amateur radio station high atop the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where fortuitously we've missed the hurricane, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our Troy, New York news bureau, where we're at about 10% foliage change, I'm Eric. KD2, RJX. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Amateur Radio's emergency communication support for Hurricane Ian leads off this week's news. As Hurricane Ian made its way across Florida and now heads towards South Carolina, amateur radio operators have continued to provide communication support for weather updates and requests for assistance. We begin our team coverage of this story with John Ross, KD8IDJ, who reports from League Headquarters in Newington. The hurricane made landfall at 3 p.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday, September 28th, just south of Tampa, Florida, as a Category 4 hurricane with winds of 150 miles per hour. Millions of residents are still without power, and damage was reported as extensive along the storm's initial path. As of 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Thursday, the National Hurricane Center reported that Ian is taking aim at the Carolinas and Georgia with life-threatening flooding, storm surge, and strong winds. ARRL Director of Emergency Management Josh Johnston, KE5MHV, has been in regular contact with ARRL Section Managers and Section Emergency Coordinators in Florida and throughout the southeastern United States. 
Johnston said ARRL is also in touch with uh, national-level partners, including FEMA and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, should any request for direct emergency communications via amateur radio be needed. Johnson said many ARRL Aries volunteers and their groups are involved across Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Many Aries groups throughout Florida have been in a state of readiness since before the weekend, said Johnston. These amateur radio volunteers are well connected with their state and local emergency management partners in government and non-government organizations. Johnston also said there is an Aries members at the request of uh, the Florida Division of Emergency Management serving in the State Emergency Operations Center. Many Aries groups are also operating in several shelter locations. W1AW, the Maxim Memorial Station at ARRL's headquarters in Connecticut, has activated its Windlink Station to handle Pactor 3 and 4 messages and traffic, as well as its shared station, NC310, NCS310. Bobby Graves, KB5HAV net manager for the Hurricane Watch Net, said the net is now transitioning from receiving weather data to gathering post-storm reports. And he added that the uh, Hurricane Weather Net may be assisting with emergency, priority, and any health and welfare traffic, and that net may continue operations for several days. The Hurricane Weather Net will issue an after-action report to detail the number of amateur radio operators who participated on the net. If you'd like more information about the hurricanes and the nets, you can go to ARRL.org. And uh, for listening or participating in the nets, it's the Hurricane Watch Net or the VOIP Hurricane Net. Visit their websites for more information on that. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. ARRL has previously deployed ham aid kits in the region. The kits include amateur radio equipment for disaster response when communications equipment is unavailable. In ARRL's experience, amateur radio's response will continue to play out, sometimes even more significantly, after the storm passes and communities enter a period of recovery, said Johnston. As needs are assessed, such as disruptions to power and communications, our ARRL section leaders and ARIES groups may receive additional requests for more activations and deployments. These reports include damage and areas that are flooded, said Graves. This gives the forecasters additional information they need. Also, since FEMA has an office in the National Hurricane Center, they look over these reports to get a bigger picture of what's happened, which in turn helps them to get help and humanitarian assistance where it's needed. Assistant HWN Net Manager Stan Broadway, N8BHL, said they have been filing reports since September 26, 2022, and over 125 specific reports have been filed to the NHC from stations in the area. We have handled other reports, not included in the database, for damage and other storm-related situations, said Broadway. One such call involved a relayed report of a woman trapped in her home with a collapsed wall in the Fort Myer area. That report was relayed to Lee County Emergency Communications to dispatch a rescue team. The Voice Over IP Hurricane Net has been active as well. Director of Operations for the Voice Over IP Hurricane Net and ARRL Eastern Massachusetts Aries Section Emergency Coordinator Rob Macedo, KD1CY, said the net will remain active potentially through 11 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Thursday evening, supporting WX4NHC the amateur radio station at the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. WX4NHC will be active through this period for as long as needed. At last check, at least 21 radio stations and six TV stations in Florida are off the air thanks to Hurricane Ian. 15 FM stations, six AMs, and six television stations notified the Federal Communications Commission that they were down, according to the FCC Communications Status Report that was issued at noon, September 29th. Meanwhile, in Puerto Rico, three radio stations remained off because of the earlier storm, Fiona. The cell phone network was hit hard by Ian, too. Counties where at least 40% of cell sites were down include Charlotte, Collier, DeSoto, Hardy, Hendry, Highlands, Lee, and Sarasota. In total, roughly 11% of cell sites in the affected area were down, according to the report, which added that the percentage of sites down does not necessarily correlate to a percentage of people without service because of overlaps and emergency sites that may be operating. As Hurricane Fiona left Canada's maritime provinces as a tropical depression, another hurricane was beginning to form in the Caribbean, tracking toward western Cuba, the Cayman Islands, and the western shores of Florida. The handoff between the two storms gave little time to relax for amateur radio operators working with the Hurricane Watch Net, VOIP Net, Salvation Army Emergency Radio Network, and emergency communications groups such as Aries. The Hurricane Watch Net has been in operations since the morning of September 27, 2022, as Hurricane Ian swept across Cuba 
and headed toward Florida's Gulf Coast. The Hurricane Watch Net continues to operate on both 14.325 and 7.268 MHz as propagation permits. The 20-meter net resumed at 8 a.m. Eastern Time on Thursday, September 29th, and will continue until further discussion and conditions warrant closing down the net. At 5 a.m. EDT on Thursday, the National Hurricane Center reported that Ian is now a tropical storm located 40 miles southeast of Orlando, Florida, with maximum sustained winds of 65 miles per hour. Ian is moving toward the northeast near 8 miles per hour and is still expected to produce strong winds, heavy rains, and storm surge across portions of Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. On the forecast track, the center of Ian is expected to move off the east central coast of Florida on Thursday evening and then approach the coast of South Carolina on Friday. The center will move farther inland across the Carolinas Friday night and Saturday, included the report. As the storm moves toward the Atlantic and then back into the coastal states, the focus of the hurricane watch net will change to receiving damage reports for the National Hurricane Center, handling messages for emergency operation centers and other agencies. The HWN will also assist Salvation Army Saturn Net partners to move health and welfare communications traffic out of the affected areas. We appreciate the cooperation of amateur operators and nets in allowing us clear frequencies to make these important contacts as Florida and the southern states work to recover, said Hurricane Watch Net Assistant Net Manager Stan Broadway, N8BHL. The HWN disseminates the latest advisories issued by the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. The net also obtains real-time ground-level weather conditions and initial damage assessments from amateur radio operators in the affected area and relays that information to the National Hurricane Center by way of WX4NHC and, when required, the Canadian Hurricane Center. Ham radio operators can follow advisories on Hurricane Ian off the main menu of the VOIP Hurricane Net website at voipwx.net or at the National Hurricane Center website at www.nhc.noaa.gov. The Federal Communications Commission has granted an AWRL emergency request for a 60-day temporary waiver intended to facilitate amateur radio emergency communications for hurricane relief. For more details on the waiver, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this report through the facilities of the Southgate Vibes News Service. The waiver was adopted on Tuesday, September the 27th, 2022, and immediately permitted amateur radio operators supporting amateur data transmission for Hurricane Ian traffic to employ a higher symbol rate for data transmissions than the current limit of 300 Bode. In its order, the FCC concluded that granting the request waiver was in the public interest. Puerto Rico was recently hit by Hurricane Fiona, and Hurricane Ian is predicted to cause significant damage, including disruption to electricity and communication services. Thus, to accommodate amateur radio operators assisting in the recovery efforts, the FCC granted the ARRL's waiver request for the period of 60 days to be effective in any parts of the United States and its territories impacted by the hurricanes. The waiver is limited to amateur radio operators in the United States and its territories using publicly documented data protocols that are compatible with FCC rules, with the exception of the data rate limit waived for those directly involved with HF Hurricane Relief Communications. The ARRL's request stated that trained amateur radio operators are working with emergency management officials and aid organizations to assist with disaster relief communications in anticipation of the arrival of Hurricane Ian. The ARRL sought the waiver for their amateur radio emergency service, that's ARES volunteers, and other amateur radio support groups working with federal, state and local emergency management officials to assist with disaster relief.
Similar written waivers have been granted by the FCC in earlier years. To qualify, a protocol or mode exceeding the 300 baud symbol rate limit must be publicly documented, use no more bandwidth than the currently permissible slower protocols, which is generally accepted to be the bandwidth of an SSB signal or 2.8 kHz, and be used solely for communications relating to hurricane relief. The FCC's standing rules prevent the use of certain protocols capable of higher data rate emissions in the HF or shortwave bands that many amateur stations active in emergency communications preparedness are capable of using. The ARRL described that equipment they plan to use exceeds the 300 baud symbol limit and that the higher data rates are critical in sending relief communications. Many use radio modems and personal computers capable of using digital protocols and modes that will permit faster messaging rates than normally permitted under the FCC's rules. The ARRL pointed out that higher data rates can be critical to timely transmission of relief communications, such as lists of needed and distributed supplies. The ARRL also explained that radio amateurs using higher speed emissions for hurricane-related messages in the United States and its territories must be able to communicate with similar stations, such as with Caribbean-based stations that are directly involved with hurricane relief efforts, and also with official federal stations on the five channels in the 5 MHz band involved with the SHARES network and other interoperability partners on those frequencies. The ARRL also pointed out that the past FCC temporary waivers have allowed such protocols in similar events, including Hurricanes Maria, Dorian, Laura and Ida, typhoon relief communications in Hawaii and wildfires in the western areas of the U.S. In 2016, in response to an ARRL petition for rulemaking, the FCC proposed to remove the symbol rate limitations, which it tentatively concluded had become unnecessary due to advances in modulation techniques and no longer served a useful purpose. That proceeding, WT Docket 16-239, is still pending in front of the Commission. The Radio Amateurs of Canada have announced a realignment of their field organization, resulting in the addition of a new section and name changes to several others, effective January 1, 2023. This will result in the changes to ARRL contests that use the ARRL and RAC sections as multipliers, including Field Day, ARRL November sweepstakes, and 160-meter contests. The Radio Amateurs of Canada field organization will be reorganized into the following sections, effective January 1. Newfoundland and Labrador, NL, Nova Scotia, NS, Prince Edward Island, PE, New Brunswick, NB, the Maritime Section, MAR, will be abolished, Quebec, QC, Ontario East, ONE, Golden Horseshoe, GH, currently called the Greater Toronto Area, GIA, Ontario South, ONS, Ontario North, ONN, Manitoba, MB, Saskatchewan, SK, Alberta, AB, British Columbia, BC, and Territories, TER, Northwest Territories, Yukon, Nunavut, will be combined into one section. Note that this change is forthcoming and will not impact the 2022 ARL November sweepstakes, or on CW, on SSB, our 160-meter contest. Please direct any questions to Dave Goodwin, VE3KG, Regulatory Affairs Officer, RAC, by email at regulatory at rac.ca. The International Telecommunications Union, the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, has announced the election of Doreen Bogdan Martin of the United States of America as the next International Telecommunications Union Secretary General. Bogdan Martin will assume office on January 1, 2023. She's radio amateur call sign KD2JTX. The election took place during ITU's plenipotentiary conference in Bucharest, Romania on Thursday, September 29, 2022. Bogdan Martin won the position with 139 votes out of 172 votes cast by representatives of member states. The ITU press release stated, This is an exciting development for ITU, said International Amateur Radio Union President Tim Allum, VE6SH. She will be the first female Secretary General and only the third to hold an amateur license. Doreen 
has an exciting agenda for ITU. The U.S. Department of State has published a statement from Bogdan Martin, as well as her biography and vision. She will make an outstanding ITU Secretary General, and one IARU will be proud to work with on behalf of Amateur Radio Services, said Ellum. The chair of the International Amateur Radio Union, or IARU, Region 1 Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee, Barry Lewis, G4SJH, reports that the ITU-R Study Group 4 has finalized the study report regarding the amateur radio 1240 to 1300 MHz band. On the IARU Region 1 site, he writes, During the period of September 7th through the 13th, 2022, the IARU once again participated in the preparatory work for World Radio Conference 2023, Agenda Item 9.1b in the International Telecommunications Union Working Party 4C. Updated studies were provided by France, and new studies were contributed by the Russian Federation GLONASS, China Compass, and Japan. The IARU provided a contribution providing information agreed in WP5A, highlighting the low duration of busy times for amateur activities in the 23-centimeter band. This information was adopted into the draft report. Whilst the studies confirmed the potential for interference to occur into co-frequency radio navigation satellite service receivers in almost the entire band, all the studies have assumed only static scenarios without any consideration of the geographic distribution and density of amateur transmitters or the temporal aspects of amateur or RNSS operations. Some studies take account of antenna patterns, but many results and conclusions focus only on worst-case main beam consideration. As a result of these studies and the regulatory status of the amateur service allocation, our ability to operate in certain parts of the band and at the power levels allowed today, it is likely to be constrained if regulators want to protect the radio navigation satellite service receivers. This discussion will continue in the development of the guidance recommendation. Study Group 4 met on September 23rd and adopted the report for publication. IARU is totally engaged in the discussion that will continue in Working Party 5A to ensure that the amateur services can continue to develop in this band and allow all the amateur applications in use today to continue. In the next couple of days, ARRL members in the Southeastern Division will receive an email message indicating that the online voting site for the 2022 ARRL Southeastern Division election is now open. The message will include instructions to access candidate statements, the ballot, and to vote. A third party was selected by the ARRL Ethics and Elections Committee to conduct the election, Election Services Corporation of Melville, New York. Some background about the effort to include an option to use electronic ballots can be found in the October 2022 issue of QST Magazine, page 63, in the article, Modernizing the ARRL Division Director and Vice Director Elections. Members should watch their email for the message from Election Services Corporation. ARRL Southeastern Division members should be sure to check their inbox and folders for spam and junk to make sure they do not miss this message. Members will also be receiving a paper ballot in a few weeks, which they can use if they prefer to vote through the mail. Please note that only one vote per member will be counted. The South African Amateur Radio League reports the Ministry of Communications and Digital Technologies has published a draft RF Spectrum policy document and comments are requested from amateurs. The SARL News is reporting that the Minister of Communication recently published the draft Next Generation Frequency Policy and has openly invited comments. Amateur radio is mentioned in the passing. It was published in the Government Gazette on September 6th, with a final date for comment within 30 working days. The SARL is currently studying the document for opportunities to increase the visibility of amateur radio by highlighting the contribution amateur radio is making to technology advancement and its contribution to the knowledge economy of South Africa. You are invited to study the policy and make some input. Send your input to AR Today, that's all one word, AR Today at sarl.org.za and secretary at sarl.org.za by September 28, 2022. The draft policy will be available on the SARL website on Sunday, September 25th. The ARRL Foundation Club Grant Program has opened a second grant proposal period, which began September 7th of 2022 and runs until November 4th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. 
Radio clubs can apply now, and information about the program can be found on the ARRL website at www.arrl.org slash club dash grant dash program. Following the first proposal period that ran earlier this year, 128 clubs applied for grants with a variety of outstanding projects. Emphasis is placed on projects that have a component of community involvement, training, new ham development, and club revitalization. 24 clubs were chosen, and nearly $270,000 was awarded. Clubs that applied in the first round and didn't receive a grant are urged to reapply. The ARRL Foundation will award an additional $230,000 in grants at the end of the second application round. An informational webinar was held on September 7th, and a recording of that event can be seen on ARRL's YouTube channel. On September 25th, 2022, the Mid-Cornwall Beacon and Repeater Group brought into service three new CW and FT8 beacons at 28.205 MHz, 40.050 MHz, and 60.300 MHz, each using the call sign GB3MCB. Located at Grid Square I-070-OJ on a 100-foot tower at 1,000 feet above sea level, these beacons, constructed by Peter Taylor, G8BCG, are ideally situated for transatlantic ES and F2 and trans-equatorial propagation. The new beacons are co-located with existing beacons on 50 MHz as part of the synchronized beacon project, in addition to those on 70 MHz, 144 MHz, 432 MHz, 1,296 MHz, and 10 GHz. GB3MCB is, de facto, the United Kingdom's premier beacon cluster. The new low VHF cluster at 28, 40, 50, 60, and 70 MHz will enable invaluable propagation monitoring and analysis as the maximum usable frequency rises. Reception reports are always welcome and the club encourages operators to spot the beacons whenever and wherever they are heard. For further information and contact details, visit the Mid-Cornwall Beacon and Repeater Group's website. Engineers have identified a number of key factors that led to the 2020 collapse of the Arecibo Telescope, once the world's largest radio telescope. A forensic examination by the New York-based firm Thornton Tomasetti identified issues that included design of the cable system with relatively low safety factors for gravity loads as well as the force of naturally occurring events in the environment. Those included Hurricane Maria in 2017 and the January 2020 earthquake tremors in Puerto Rico where the telescope was located. The report said that despite having a hurricane-resistant design, Arecibo's cable system had already led it to suffer stress under its own weight whenever storms hit. The engineers recommended higher safety factors for cable systems under such conditions. Although the investigators said they found the telescope to be generally well-maintained, they did note in their report that they found that moisture had intruded paint had degraded and individual wires had broken within the support cable system. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Ah, I'm a little nervous about what's going on in the United Kingdom. I don't know. It's a different country. I know if you're living in the U.S., you're going, well, what do you care? Well, the UK passed something five years ago now called the Snoopers Charter. Well, I don't think that the, I don't think Parliament called it the Snoopers Charter, but everybody else calls it the Snoopers Charter. The uh, Parliament called it the Investigatory Powers Act. And one of the powers they gave the police in England and the United Kingdom uh, is the power to essentially surveil everybody's web access all the time. So now they're testing it. Took them a while, but they're testing it. Two unnamed internet service providers, probably one of the big ones, a couple of them, uh, when queried about this by wired.co.uk, said, no comment. That means they're probably the ones, right? And the National Crime Agency. Well, we're all against crime. Nobody likes crime. Law and order, it's a good thing. I'm not against it. But I am against 
what what they call fishing expeditions, where they, in effect, it's like gathering the haystack just in case there's a needle in there, just in case. Then we have the whole haystack. So the the Home Office, the National Crime Agency, and two ISPs are get now. So you tell me what you think about this. They're collecting everything you do online. The the they call it the ICRs or Internet Connection Records. The everything you do online, except for the, what you're doing on that page, but which pages you go to, which pages you search for, all of that is being recorded for everyone who uses those ISPs. Just in case at some point a crime occurs, is committed, and the National Crime Agency needs to, you know, find out what's going on. Now they have everything, right? Because it's too late. Once the crime has occurred, you can't go back in time and say, well, what, what was what was that person doing so they're they're collecting everything and by the way the law the investigatory powers act or snoopers charter says that service providers who are doing this cannot talk about it we have something like that here in the united states too i should mention but nothing like the snoopers charter the apps you use the domains you visit domains not the actual pages okay ip addresses when you begin to use the internet and when you stop using the internet and the amount of data that's transferred to and from the device it's not you know i think that the, when they passed it they said well don't worry don't worry don't worry we're not collecting information about the actual pages you visit or what you do on those pages just the fact that you visited but as we i think a lot of us now know if if you collect that they call it metadata there's a lot you can tell from metadata I like the I like the uh, one uh, privacy advocate said it's like collecting the whole haystack for a couple of needles. Just get the whole thing. You never know. They're trialing it. They can do it by law. And I suspect, you know, I know this happens. Our Congress looks over the over the Atlantic and says, well, that worked. Let's try it here. They're doing that already with what happened in Australia. I don't know if you know, the Australians proposed a bill that would essentially tax links the bill was proposed by rupert murdoch and uh, big journalist uh, organizations journal newspapers and so forth in australia because they said well google uh when they you know when you do a search result for a news story it shows the link to the page but it also shows a little snippet from the link and they said they should be paying for that snippet <laughs> okay <laughs> google says you should be paying for the search result <laughs> <laughs> We're sending you traffic worth a lot more. Nobody's going to read the snippet and say, well, I don't need to read the rest of it. No, they use as you, I mean, think about your own search use. You search for something. The snippets help you know if that's the page you want. And then if it is, you go to that page. Google says we're driving traffic. Eventually, uh, the law forced Google and uh, Facebook to do deals to pay basically the, the big companies for those links. And now, U.S. lawmakers are saying, hey, that worked. Let's try it. The Journalism Competition and Preservation Act of 2021 would allow small news outlets to join forces to negotiate as a collective block with online content distributors, Facebook and Google, for favorable terms. Favorable terms. The contention is that without, well, here's what Microsoft's president, Microsoft piling on, by the way. <laughs> Pay no attention to the problems we're having with the exchange servers. Pay no attention to all those hacks. No, no, no. You know, the problem today in America is there's a fundamental lack of competition in search and ad tech markets. It's controlled by Google. By the way, Microsoft is in that market. It's not doing as well. As a result, says Brad Smith, Microsoft president, testifying in front of a Congress this week. As a result, there's a persistent and structural imbalance between a technology gatekeeper and the free press. So... Go ahead, tax them. Don't tax us. Oh, we're fine. But you can tax Google and Facebook. Uh, okay. <laughs> Google says, Microsoft just is trying to distract you from their the, the horrible hacks. Boy, this was the week, I tell you. The, uh, it's called, Microsoft called it Hafnium. Because what they don't want you to do is call it the Exchange Server Hack. But that's what it is. Microsoft... Uh, exchange servers widely used by businesses and government to run their email systems. And oh, what a mess. What a mess. This hack has now spread to hundreds of thousands of organizations. 
Eve, the patch came out, even though Microsoft knew about it a month before they patched it. The patch came out. But unfortunately, people were hacked before the patch came out. It's just pervasive. It's everywhere. And security experts are saying if you're running Exchange email server, which a lot, again, a lot of companies do, assume you've been hacked. Just assume. This is the second one, the second big governmental hack. Remember Solar Winds? Microsoft also involved in that. I'm told I shouldn't use the word hack or hacker. Hackers, some of whom are good people, most of whom are good people. Hackers, originally hackers meant the people who, you know, take computer hardware and software and make it do new things, you know, bang on it, hack on it. The idea came from, you know, you're, you're kind of hacking around like a golfer hacks around, you know, maybe not, not really with precision, <laughs> but, but you're getting things done. Then it kind of came to mean a bad guy and the folks there's a whole hacking is not a crime movement they're asking journalists if you go to hacking is not a crime.org you could see in big letters hacking is not a crime they're asking journalists to stop using the term hacker and hacking for evil vile menacing exploits they don't offer a alternative <laughs> unfortunately they say it's law breaking they're criminals that's not what hackers are. Hacking is not a crime. It's the ethical endeavor of exploration and problem solving. I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. Unfortunately, language doesn't really <laughs> lend itself. For a long time, I, you know, I'm a podcaster. I do podcasts. And for a long time, I said, don't call him a podcast. That's an Apple device. It has nothing to do with an iPod. Don't call him. It's netcasting. You're, you, instead of broadcasting, which is what this show is, broadcast. It's a netcast. It's over the internet. Nobody, no, I couldn't convince anybody. I gave in. I said, eh, it's a podcast. Okay, fine. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. Okay, I knew it would happen. When I started this series, I expected three questions would be asked. When did ham radio start? Who was the first ham? And where did the word ham come from? To answer these questions, let's head back to the 19th century. Practical Wireless had its start in 1896, when Marconi first sent a signal over a distance of two miles. By 1899, he succeeded in sending a wireless message across the English Channel, a distance of 32 miles. The year 1899 also marks the first construction project, which appeared in American Electrician magazine. In December 1901, Marconi claimed to bridge the Atlantic, a feat which caught the world's attention and fueled the imagination of thousands of potential amateurs who took their first steps into wireless. In the early days, everything was spark. What exactly was spark? Well, sit down some summer night, listen to your AM or shortwave radio, and count the static crashes. Now, turn on the vacuum cleaner or an electric shaver and listen to your radio again. Hear that noise? In short, Spark Wireless was merely a form of controlled static. A high voltage inside a spark coil would jump across a gap, which was coupled to an antenna. The spark was keyed on and off to transmit the code. The signal generated was extremely broad. A state-of-the-art 1906 spark transmitter operating on 400 meters, or 750 kilocycles, would actually generate a signal from about 250 meters, or 1,200 kilocycles, to 550 meters, or 545 kilocycles. Receivers were no better. Before 1912, all systems were basically unamplified detectors. Tuners were primitive or non-existent. As might be expected, by today's standards, the early wireless stations were terribly inefficient. Transmitting ranges ranged from as little as 600 feet with a one-half inch coil to perhaps 100 miles from a kilowatt station and a 15-inch spark coil. Ships at sea with five kilowatt transmitters might get as much as 500 miles maximum range over the ocean. It was into this world that the early amateurs ventured. Actually, if we were to concentrate on the years prior to 1908, 
It would be more appropriate to say experimenters rather than amateurs, for in the first decade of wireless, there was little or no interest in personal communications with other stations. Rather, the concentration was on technical development, either in the interest of pure science or, more often than not, with an eye towards cashing in on this new medium. Experimenters were unorganized and, with the exception of those immediate stations with whom they ran tests, had no knowledge or interest in other pioneer stations. Any true amateurs prior to 1908 had been lost in prehistoric obscurity. By 1908, however, the face of wireless began to change. Technical developments had reached their first plateau, and a number of major competitors had formed the first wireless trust, called United Wireless. With a temporary truce in effect, equipment was now more readily available to the public. Along with this, new magazines such as Modern Electrics were formed with wireless communication as the primary thrust. The circulation of Modern Electrics jumped from 2,000 to over 30,000 in just two years. The year 1908 also saw the first handbook, Wireless Telegraph Construction for Amateurs. It is difficult to know exactly how many amateur stations were on the air in this completely unregulated laissez-faire era, but reliable estimates put the number of major stations, that is, those capable of communicating over 10 miles, at 600, while minor stations with a one- or two-mile range probably numbered 3,000 or more. Thus, if a year had to be arbitrarily chosen as the start of amateur radio, it would probably be 1908. As for the first, amateur, that's a harder one. Without licensing, regulations, or written record, there will never be a definitive answer to this question. However, the name W.E.D. Stokes Jr. has come up. He was a founding member and the first president of the first amateur radio club, the Junior Wireless Club Limited of New York City. This organization was formed on January 2nd, 1909. Other founding members who might lay claim to the title First Amateur were George Eltz, Frank King, and Fred Seymour. Later that same year, the Wireless Association of America and the Radio Club of Salt Lake City were created. By 1910, wireless clubs were springing up all over the country and the first call book, the Wireless Blue Book, was published. Since there were no regulations in this period, the call signs listed in the Blue Book were self-assigned, which brings us to our third question. Where did the word ham come from? The most logical explanation is that commercial operators referred to the unlicensed and sometimes inexperienced amateurs as hams, probably meaning ham-handed or ham-fist. Amateurs, however, took this derogatory term and turned it into a lasting and complimentary nickname. However, legend has it there was a phenomenal station on the air with five kilowatts who could be heard at all hours of the day and night at distances of over 500 miles. The station operator used his initials for his call sign, H-A-M. I don't know if this is the real story, but I've always liked this explanation best. Amateur radio continued to grow. By 1911, Modern Electrics had a circulation of 52,000 and there were 10,000 amateurs in the country. With thousands of stations on the air, both amateur and commercial, interference was becoming a serious problem, especially in maritime communication. Ships, because of their restricted antenna length, were limited to frequencies between 450 and 600 meters, or 666 to 500 kilocycles. As we have seen, one spark station could take up this entire spectrum, Thus, it was imperative that all stations cooperate and stand by when the others were transmitting. Sadly, this was often not the case. In addition to interference between amateurs and commercial stations, there was more interference and sometimes deliberate jamming between commercial stations of different companies. Prodded by the Navy, which was using inefficient and outdated equipment and thus suffering from excessive interference, the U.S. Congress was starting to take a serious look at wireless regulation. However, before they could take up proposed legislation, an incident happened that would quickly and dramatically alter the structure of the wireless spectrum. On April 15, 1912, the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank. Thanks to wireless and the first SOS in history, 713 lives were saved. 
However, it has been argued that the number of survivors could have been doubled or even tripled if there were stronger wireless regulations in effect. We are going to keep a sharp eye on the Titanic and on a 22-year-old experimenter in Yonkers, New York, who would soon be making some major contributions to radio. So, until then, keep that spark gap adjusted and those raspy CQs coming. We'll catch you next time on the Ancient Amateur Archives. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Here's this week's AMSAT news from Bruce Page, KK5DO. The AMSAT Symposium, October 21st and 22nd, will be the first time we've been able to have a face-to-face get-together since the beginning of COVID. This is a wonderful opportunity to have conversations with other hams that are interested in satellites and to express your ideas. As AMSAT President Bankston, KE4AL, said in this month's Apogee View in the journal, some of AMSAT's most innovative accomplishments started with a discussion that began at a symposium. You hope you can join us in Bloomington, Minnesota. More details at AMSAT.org. We now have rovers hitting the highway soon. Wayne W7WGC will be roving in Oregon from September 28th through October 3rd for the Parks on the Air program. He'll be in CN 74, 75, and 76, and also CN 85 and 86. Mitch AD0HG, one of our recent Gridmaster Award recipients, will be roving in DN 72, 73, DN 82 and 83, DN 92 and DN 93 from October 4th through October 6th. And Halvard LA7XK slash JW7XK will be operating from Salvabard in JQ78 from October 5th through October 10th on RS44. A good opportunity if you are within the footprint of the satellite for a pretty good and rare grid and DXCC entity. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington, who reports that sunspot activity rose this reporting week. September 22nd through the 28th, with average daily sunspot numbers increasing from 68 to 105.1. But solar flux? Not so much. Average daily solar flux rose from 134.3 to 138.4. So, the sunspot average rose 55% and solar flux only 3%. New sunspots appeared on September 22nd and 23rd, and one more appeared on September 27th. On Thursday night, September 29th, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration reported the daily sunspot number at 56, little more than half the average for the previous seven days, which was 105.1. However, Tuesday, September 27th had lots of geomagnetic activity with the planetary A index at 24, and the middle latitude at 33. Spaceweather.com blamed an unexpected coronal mass ejection. They also reported a huge sunspot beyond the sun's eastern horizon. The Australian Space Weather Forecasting Center issued a geomagnetic warning at 2146 UTC on September 28th, which read geomagnetic 27-day reoccurrence patterns indicate that G1 geomagnetic activity is likely during the interval September 30th through October 2nd. Increased geomagnetic activity is expected due to a coronal hole and high-speed wind streams. So with all of that, let's look ahead to the predicted solar flux from the Thursday night forecast, which appears much more optimistic. 146 on October 1st through the 4th, 140 on October 5th through the 7th, and then 135, 130, 128, and 132 on October 8th through the 11th. Looking at the planetary A index, it is predicted at 60 and 40 on October 1st and 2nd, then 20, 18, and 16 on October 3rd through the 5th, and then 12 on October 6th and 7th, and 8 on October 8th through the 14th. In radio sport contesting this week, many opportunities, all from October 1st through the 2nd, the Worked All Provinces of China DX Contest, that's CW, the Oceana DX Contest, that's phone, the Russian WW uh, Digital Contest, digital of course, October 1st and 2nd, the IARU Region 1 AUHF Microwaves Contest, the W phone and digital, also on October 1st through the 2nd, the International Hell Contest, the California QSO Party, CW and Phone, the SKCC QSO Party, that's CW, 
and the UBA ON contest at single sideband. That's on phone. Also, October 1st and 2nd is the RSGB DX contest. That is CW and phone. Upcoming section state and digital or division conventions, and here is an important announcement first. The Rock Hill Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL South Carolina section convention in Rock Hill, South Carolina, which was scheduled for October 1st, has been rescheduled now for November 12th. Also on the agenda for October 1st, the Wichita Area Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Kansas State Convention, that's in Wichita, Kansas. October 7th and 8th, the Melbourne Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Florida State Convention in Melbourne, Florida. October 7th and 8th, the Slidell EOC Ham Fest, and hosting the ARRL Louisiana State Convention in the Slidell, Louisiana. October 7th through 9th, the ARRL Rocky Mountain Division Convention in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And October 9th, the Nutmeg Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Connecticut State Convention. That's in North Haven, Connecticut. Foundations of Amateur Radio It's been a while since I looked up the word patriotic. Depending on which dictionary definition you use, it could be showing love for your country and being proud of it. Or it could mean having or expressing devotion to and vigorous support of one's country. Synonyms for the word patriotic include nationalist or nationalistic, and it relates to words such as chauvinist, jingoist and fervent. Jingoist means having or showing excessive favoritism towards one's own country. That said, the original Amateurs Code published in 1927 says that the amateur is patriotic. His knowledge and his station are always ready for the service of his country and his community. The 2022 ARRL Handbook says, The radio amateur is patriotic, station and skill always ready for service to country and community. The ARRL website is slightly different. The radio amateur is patriotic. His, her station and skills are always ready for service to country and community. Based on the meaning and connotations of the word patriotic, I think that the sixth clause of the Amateurs Code is a political statement. It came at the close of World War I, and in that context it makes sense. I will also note that the word patriotic means different things to different people. For some, it's a positive concept. For others, it's the opposite. And I think, as a result, it's a problematic concept in the world today. If that's not clear to you, consider the notion of patriotic to a person living in the United States of America versus a person living in Ukraine or a person living in North Korea, Sudan, China or Japan. Each of these countries have different concepts of the idea of patriotic, which might not actually be compatible with each other. Should we, as a global community, encourage cohesion or encourage incompatibility? A more inclusive word might be loyal, but we've already covered that. I've offered the following revision of the original loyalty clause to be The radio amateur is loyal, offering encouragement and participation to the global amateur community. We could add the word country to that and dispense with the patriotic clause altogether. But I think that detracts from what the sixth clause is attempting to achieve, the sharing of station and skill to country and community. What if we replace the word patriotic with supportive instead? I also think that the lost word knowledge is separate from station and skill, and I think it has a place in this clause. The clause would read, The radio amateur is supportive. Knowledge, station and skills always ready for service to country and community. I'm aware that, given the wide range of meanings for the word patriotic across Earth, this is likely to be controversial. But in considering this version, please consider the level of emotion included in your feeling of the word patriotic versus the emotion for the word supportive. It seems to me that reducing the level of emotion in a code of conduct is a positive evolution. What are your thoughts on the matter? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The Central Coast Amateur Radio Club in New South Wales is hoping everyone can join them at their next outing, a portable operate and picnic event. Yes, this means hams in Europe and North America. The club is setting up a big festive gathering on the 15th of October at Terrigal Haven on Australia's South Pacific coastline, where members will socialize with one another while promoting amateur radio to strangers. Of course, if there's an ocean or a continent or both in the way of your being there, that's no excuse for not participating. 
starting at 11.30 a.m. local time and going through at least until 4 p.m. Radio operators at the outing will have a path on 20 meters into New Zealand, North America, and as the day wears on, signals will be favored into Europe. Listen for the club call signs VK2AFW and VK2WFD. Meanwhile, the Australian Communications and Media Authority announced it was asking for amateurs to comment on the proposed class license for non-assigned amateur and outpost stations. Steve Richards, G4HPE, from the Southgate Vibes News Service, has more. Australia's communications regulator, ACMA, has asked radio amateurs to comment on their proposed new amateur class license and considerations for higher power one kilowatt operation. Following the extensive 2021 public consultation and associated response to submissions, the ACMA have released a consultation paper on the proposed amateur class license and supporting operational arrangements, along with considerations for higher power operation. This is the next step in their review of regulatory arrangements for the operation of non-assigned amateur stations. The draft class license for amateur radio has been amended to incorporate changes suggested by representative bodies, amateur radio clubs and individual amateurs during the 2021 consultation. The consultation paper, proposed class license and details about how to make a submission are available on the ACMA website at www.acma.gov.au and submissions close on Tuesday the 29th of November 2022. ACMA says that if you have an important question about the consultation, send it directly to Spectrum Licensing Policy at acma.gov.au. ACMA says that they may use the Amateur Radio Update e-bulletin to answer frequently asked questions. You can subscribe to the ACMA Amateur Radio Newsletter at www.acma.gov.au. The ACMA website at acma.gov.au is accepting submissions until the close of business on the 29th of November. That site again, acma.gov. .au. It took 12 years and ultimately two groups of amateur radio operators to return a man to his home and his family in Bangladesh. The reunion took place on September 21st, allowing the man to leave the state-run home in Kolkata, where he had been following a lengthy hospitalization. His family reported that he had gone missing a dozen years ago. He apparently crossed the border into West Bengal. Press reports in the Millennium Post and other media outlets described the 27-year-old man as mentally challenged and thus unable to provide information about his origins, either to hospital personnel or later to those at the state home. Authorities at the home contacted the West Bengal Amateur Radio Club, where club secretary Anush Nigbaswas, VU2JFA, visited the man and determined he was from Bangladesh. He reached out for help to Anup Baumik, S21TV, Secretary of the Amateur Radio Society of Bangladesh. The two clubs arranged for a video call between the man and his family, and after that, details were worked out for his return home. The Antique Wireless Association says that in the late 1950s, television networks in the USA ruled the airwaves from 7 to 11 p.m. But outside of that time slot, television was live, local and unpredictable. Jim Hanlon, Whiskey 8 Kilo Golf India, worked as a summer relief engineer at Cincinnati's WCPO-TV from 1956 to 1958. At that time, WCPO-TV did not have any video recording technology, so all local TV was live TV and provided a refreshing dose of live programming, equipment failures and production creativity that's been lost in today's pasteurised, homogenised TV ecosystem. In an amusing romp around 1950s budget TV, Jim presents a podcast as he recalls what it's like producing live TV programming in the early days of television broadcasting. Jim commentates around a series of slides from the time which really shows just how wing and a prayer the production was. Just search on YouTube for mid-century television live, local and unpredictable. And you can help keep communications history alive by becoming a member of the Antique Wireless Association. 
To find out more, go to www.antiquewireless.org. An updated tool has become available to help hams in the UK comply with Ofcom license requirements to monitor their station's electromagnetic field exposure, or EMF. The Radio Society of Great Britain has made changes to both its online calculator and web app, and are seeking feedback on the new versions which have been launched on a trial basis. The new calculators enable hams to determine EIRP as well as compliance distances. According to the RSGB website, the updated calculators no longer have the previous version's 10 MHz minimum frequency restriction or the minimum separation of the near field boundary. They recommend a compliance distance of 2.4 meters to keep people from coming into contact with the antenna. The new version also calculates limits set by the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection for 1998 and 2020. There is still time to register for the 2022 NASA International Space Apt Challenge, running from October 1st and 2nd. One of this year's challenges is calling all radio enthusiasts. Data from the amateur radio on the International Space Station broadcast and reception systems, as well as networks of ham radio broadcasters, can be utilized for applied heliophysics research. The challenge is to develop an application that uses these data sets to construct and display images of Earth's ionosphere. You can participate in person or virtually. Last year, over 28,000 participants competed from 162 countries and territories. Visit the Space Apt Challenge website to register and for more information. South Africa's independent online web pages report that Zimbabwe's first satellite, ZimSat-1, carrying an amateur radio APRS digipeter, is expected to be launched to the International Space Station in October. The satellite will host a multispectral camera and image classification tool, as well as a device to transmit and receive signals from amateur radio operators. APRS is the Amateur Packets Reporting System, and the signals can include object GPS coordinates, weather station telemetry, text messages, announcements, queries, and other telemetry. Named ZimSat-1, the Sunday Mail in Zimbabwe reported that the nano-satellite will reach the International Space Station next month before it's launched into orbit, scheduled for November. ZimSat-1 will be on board the Cygnus NG-18, an uncrewed spacecraft that provides commercial cargo resupply to the International Space Station on behalf of NASA, from where it will be released into space. Zimbabwe's ambitious satellite is reportedly scheduled to reach the International Space Station by the 28th of October, before being launched from the Kibo, Japan's science module on the International Space Station. You can read more at www.iol.co.za and the Zimbabwe Sunday Mail can be found at www.sundaymail.co.zw. And students at the National Technical University of Ukraine, the Igor Sikorsky Kiev Polytechnic Institute, have built an amateur radio CubeSat, which they expect to launch soon. The 2U CubeSat, QBUA01, is a project driven by Kiev National University. The mission is to launch a Ukrainian educational satellite built by KPI students and space exploration enthusiasts for solving a number of educational, scientific and technological university problems. Specific mission targets are the construction and launch of a nano-satellite to test advanced space technologies, study the available capabilities and find new tasks for the development of near space and also to study the operation of solar sensors, a GPS GLONASS receiver, magnetometers, gyroscopes, electromagnets and flywheels in systems which provide orientation and stabilization in space. They also want to look at thermal regulation of a local heat source based on microheat pipes in low orbit, as well as testing the operation of new software to control satellite systems and obtain telemetry at the ground station. Amateur operators around the world will be able to participate in the mission by receiving satellite telemetry, beacon and science payload data about the microheat pipe. 
You can find out more at cubesat.com.ua. The students are proposing a 9K6 data download on UHF using the AX25 packets protocol. The launch is planned for November 2022 on the Transporter 6 SpaceX mission into a 530km sun-synchronous orbit. You can read a lot more by visiting www.amsatuk.me.uk. The Andrew Johnson Amateur Radio Club in Tennessee has donated a collection of new and used ham radio-related books to the Greenville Green County Public Library. The press release from the club that appeared in the Greenville Sun newspaper said the gift was part of the group's mission to provide community service and advocate for radio knowledge and education. The group thanked the Walmart Distribution Center in Greene County for a $500 donation that helped the club compile the book collection. The books were presented to the library by President Ian Bible, KE4EAC, and Secretary Treasurer Larry Whiteside, KN4MVH. The books include Ham Radio for the New Ham by Stan W. Merrill, two copies of Ham Radio for Dummies by H. Ward Silver, and The World of Ham Radio, 1901 to 1950, A Social History. For tinkerers, there is Antique Radio Restoration Guide by David Johnson and Antique Radio Repair and Restoration by Alfred Corbin, which discusses vacuum tube radios. A number of ARRL publications are also in the collection, including a digital handbook and a license manual. The annual AM QSO party sponsored by the Antique Wireless Association isn't so much a contest as a challenge. It invites hams to get on the air using radio's original form of voice communication, amplitude modulation. Ron Skipper, W8ACR, coordinator of the AM QSO party for the Antique Wireless Association, considers this year's event a success. The weekend operation introduced hams to amplitude modulation or reminded long-timers that AM is still a viable option. During the two-day activity on September 24th and 25th, Ron himself made 40 or so contacts during the QSO party. He said that three of those operators he logged said they were experiencing either their first or second time using AM mode. Ron went on to say, I think that once a ham operator uses AM successfully, he realizes that it is a viable alternative to single sideband and not just an outdated mode of communication. Rag chews were encouraged and, for others, so is simply listening. Ron reminds hams that there's plenty of time now to prepare for the next AM QSO party. If your rig already has AM mode, try it out. If you have vintage gear at home, dust it off. Or, if you're a home brewer, get busy and build that AM transmitter. ARL member Brian Daly, WB7OML, who received the AT&T Fellows Honor in 2021, is being recognized by AT&T as a trailblazer in the telecommunications standards industry. The AT&T Fellows Honor is given to individuals in the AT&T technical community who have made sustained and notable contributions to scientific and technical achievements that have impacted AT&T's business. Daly is the Assistant Vice President of Standards and Industry Alliances for AT&T and helped develop the wireless services, including wireless emergency alerts and AT&T's nationwide public safety network, FirstNet. In the aftermath of 9-11, Daly was approached by the FCC after Congress passed the Warning, Alert, and Response Network, or the WARN Act, to help develop a public warning system using cellular technology. Daly's team identified the technical and operational requirements for the technology and paved the way for WEA, which launched in 2012. WEA was sent during the Boston Marathon bombing tragedy, Superstorm Sandy throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, and in countless other emergencies, said Daly. Knowing that I had something to do with the more than 70,000 WEA that have been employed to inform and protect people in times of crisis, and the fact that out of 23 children have been found, thanks to WEA delivered Amber Alerts, is one of the greatest rewards of doing what I do at AT&T, Daly said. Daly continues to provide expertise to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the National Weather Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, and state, local, and tribal agencies. He's also a volunteer for the FirstNet Response Operations Group and trained to deploy a dedicated FirstNet satellite cell on a light truck to restore cell systems damaged by emergencies. 
Daly holds an amateur extra license and is a technical specialist for the AWRL Georgia section. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Here's a subject most hams have had to deal with, on towers, on the roof, or on the ground, waterproofing coax connections. Let's look at the four most popular products I know of. The most commonly used product I know of is called coax seal. This stuff is sold on small rolls, about a half an inch wide and 60 inches long. It is easy to apply to clean and dry surfaces. At the size sold, one roll does not cover much except maybe one or two small connectors. My experience with coax seal is it stands up to the elements well over a period of years and is somewhat reusable for the first months in the environment. On a commercial tower, the white strips of paper fly away nicely in a gentle breeze. Being sold on a roll, it is easy to secure several to a climbing belt like rolls of electrical tape. In a tool bag, it tends to get squished into shapes that make it hard to use. Another method of protecting connections is with liquid electrical tape. This stuff is commonly sold in small, 4 ounce cans at the hardware store. These small cans are similar to those used for PVC cement and include a brush. This substance is similar to a solvent dissolved polymer, perhaps even rubber. Since it is kept in a liquid state with solvents, which evaporate when it applied or when the can is left open, you probably don't want to smoke while the can is open. After application with this product, the protective layer tends to be much thinner than with the wrap type sealer. This does make an excellent underlayer when using a wrap-on sealer. For ground level connections where repeated layers can be added, this stuff is both easy to use and a good value. Liquid electrical tape probably cannot be applied over coax seal, but it can be applied onto less than perfect surfaces. But again, clean and dry is best. According to the label, multiple layers can be added if you allow the stuff to set for about five minutes. Since it is sold in the can, it rides along in the tool bag, but is easily dropped. Although I've only seen one, this one used a couple of times, some people still use electrical tape to seal coax connections. I do not recommend using electrical tape unless it is used as a cover over one of the wraps or brush on sealers. Problem with electrical tape is it ages poorly when exposed to sunlight, moisture, heat and more it tends to start to unwrap over time, crack or get brittle. When you've installed as many antennas as I have, you've probably read some mention of how thickly you can cover a connection before you mess up that antenna's ability to shed rainwater. So the bottom line on, on electrical tape is I will not recommend using it as a primary protective layer. The fourth method I know of is similar to coax seal on rolls. Some commercial climbers use insulation wrap for automotive air conditioner systems. There are lots of brands available so you'll have to go to several auto parts stores to hunt for the really good stuff. This wrap is much wider and thicker than coax seal and comes on a roll just like coax seal. This is made to be wrapped on metal tubes coming in and out of automotive air conditioner compressors to reduce dripping of water, improve efficiency and protect from the elements. And since it is made to stand up to the elements and is also cost effective, the only startup cost for you is doing the research and finding a brand and a supplier. There are lots of different kinds, so look for the one most like coax seal and test it on your own before using it on someone else's antenna. Oh yeah, there is one more similar to coax seal. It is sold in a toothpaste type tube. I've never used any, so I can't comment on how it holds up to Mother Nature or how it is to use. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Electronics Notes website describes how to build an HF dipole antenna for the amateur bands. Dipoles are one of the simplest antennas to build or construct and erect for the HF amateur radio bands, and on top of this, they can be very effective.
Dipoles are widely used on bands like 80 meters, 40 meters, 20, 15 and 10 meters, where they can provide excellent levels of performance. A dipole antenna can be a very effective antenna, providing a good level of performance, especially if it's erected as high as reasonably possible and away from obstructions. Building an HF ham radio dipole does not have to be expensive either. Often, the items needed can be salvaged from previous antenna projects or bought for relatively small cost. Wire, feeder, insulators and fixings are all that is required. Building the antenna and erecting it can provide a great insight into aerials and how they work, and in this way the performance of the station can be enhanced even further. The most straightforward way to install a dipole is as a horizontal antenna, although this is by no means the only way. Also, a dipole is most commonly found as a half-wavelength dipole, although this is not the only length that can be used. Feeding the dipole at a high current point, as is the case of centre feeding a half-wave dipole, means that it's fed at a current maximum point on the antenna. This gives a low impedance feed, and this matches nicely to 50 ohm coaxial cable. It's also possible to have longer lengths. Antennas with lengths that are odd multiples of half wavelengths also provide a low impedance. This means that a 40 meter dipole can also be used as a three half wavelength dipole on 15 meters. The basic half wave dipole itself is quite straightforward, consisting of a radiating element half a wavelength long, erected between two supports and fed in the center. Often, these supports may be a suitable point on a house and another support in the garden. On the house, it can be possible to attach the dipole to the chimney or other high point. Then another support may be a pole or even a tree. There even may be another suitable building. If using a tree as a support, it must be remembered that the tree will move in the wind. If the antenna wire becomes too tight as the wind moves the tree backwards and forwards, it could break the wire. This must be taken into account, and there are several methods of overcoming this problem. When buying anything for the antenna, it's wise to remember that the rigours of the weather will quickly take their toll on any components, so using top quality and weatherproofing where possible is always good. Driving rain, wind, sunlight, UV, etc. all mean that components will have to be of sufficient quality to last. Obviously, one of the key requirements for the antenna is the wire itself. Whilst normal insulated copper wire can be used, copper stretches very easily, and it will be found that over time the antenna lengthens as a result of the strain on it. Often, hard-drawn copper wire is used, and this stretches far less. If a tree is used as the remote anchor point, some means of strain relief is required to account for any movement on the tree. This can be accomplished by using a pulley and then attaching a weight to the bottom. The weight applies the strain to the antenna to keep it in place, but the weight is able to move up and down to accommodate the movement of the tree. There are some simple rules of thumb to follow. It's best to install the HF handband antenna so that it's as high as possible. It's surprising the improvement that raising an antenna gives. As it starts to clear the surrounding objects, it will receive and radiate far better. As far as possible, the HF handband dipole antenna should be kept away from other objects. In a domestic environment, this is not always possible, but a little planning and forethought can make the best of any installation. If coaxial cable is used, it's essential that the top end is sealed. If not, moisture can enter the cable and the loss will increase considerably. Coaxial cable is not cheap, and even a small amount of water ingress can degrade its performance. You can read the full article, which includes lots of useful diagrams, at www.electronics-notes.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. 
If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater system, K2RHI, on 146.94 MHz, serving Albany and the Tri-Cities of New York State from the top of Mount Raffinesque in Brunswick, New York. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 